Welcome to the Commission press room, ladies and gentlemen, for this joint press conference by Michel Barnier, the European Commission Chief Negotiator for Article 50 negotiation, Mr. David Davis, Secretary of State for exiting the European Union. I'll give the floor first to Michel Barnier. Uh, thank you, Margarete. Good afternoon to all of you, and once again, Davis, welcome in Brussels. Uh, Mesdames, Messieurs, en français d'abord. Merci d'abord à chacune et chacun d'entre vous pour votre attention vigilante, permanente à cette négociation. D'emblée, je veux dire que vous ne devez pas attendre de nous aujourd'hui, au moment où nous sommes, d'annonces ou de décisions. Les discussions de ces derniers jours sont dans le moment où nous sommes, entre deux conseils européens, un moment d'approfondissement, de clarification et encore et encore de travail technique. Nous sommes dans ce moment, je suis, dans un état d'esprit volontariste pour trouver un accord sur cette première séquence du retrait ordonné du Royaume-Uni, comme il l'a décidé, de l'Union européenne. Et c'est la priorité absolue qui est la nôtre, qui est la mienne, celle de mon équipe, dans la perspective du Conseil européen des 14 et 15 décembre prochains. Les décisions du Conseil européen, notamment le mois dernier, et les résolutions du Parlement européen me guident chaque jour dans ce travail. Et quand vous lisez ces résolutions, quand vous lisez les conclusions du Conseil européen, vous voyez à nouveau que seuls des progrès suffisants, c'est-à-dire des progrès sincères et réels, sur les trois grands sujets clés de cette négociation, seuls ces progrès suffisants permettront d'enclencher la deuxième phase de notre négociation et... Ces trois sujets sont, vous le savez, je le redis, euh, indissociables. Je veux également redire, dans cette négociation extraordinaire et extraordinairement complexe, que nous ne demandons pas de concessions au Royaume-Uni et que nous ne sommes pas dans l'idée de faire des concessions. Nous travaillons sur des faits, nous travaillons sur des bases légales, nous travaillons sur des engagements réciproques et précis. Et nous devons, nous voulons, remettre de la sécurité, notamment de la sécurité juridique, là où le Brexit crée de l'incertitude et beaucoup d'inquiétudes. Ladies and gentlemen, on citizen rights, we are making some progress. Also, we need to work further on a number of points. The UK wants to put in place administrative procedures through which EU citizens can obtain settled status. The EU needed reassurances on how such a system would work. It should be simple to use and low cost. We also needed reassurance on how people, when rejected, can appeal effectively. effectively. The UK has now provided useful, useful clarifications that are a good basis for further work. We also had encouraging discussions on direct effect of the withdrawal agreement. And this is a key point to guarantee citizens' rights. There are still a number of points that need more work. Family reunification, the right to export social security benefits, and the role of the European Court of Justice in guaranteeing consistent application of case law in the UK and in the EU. These three issues are important for people as the European Parliament 
has also stressed. On Ireland, we will continue our dialogue on Ireland and Northern Ireland. We have to ensure a common reading, the same reading of the conditions, consequences, and implications of Brexit and the Good Friday Agreement and the common travel area. This should lead us to identify the technical and regulatory solutions necessary to prevent a hard border while preserving the integrity of the single market. As David and I told you last time, the unique situation on the island of Ireland requires specific solutions. Finalement, sur le règlement financier, nous devons travailler maintenant sur la traduction précise des engagements pris dans son discours à Florence par le Premier ministre britannique Theresa May. C'est une condition, je le redis, impérative pour atteindre des progrès suffisants en décembre. Sur ce sujet, je répète qu'il s'agit seulement, comme dans toute séparation, seulement et simplement de solder les comptes. Mesdames et Messieurs, le Royaume-Uni a décidé de quitter l'Union il y a plus de 500 jours et il quittera effectivement l'Union le 29 mars 2019 à minuit, heure de Bruxelles. Et pour atteindre notre objectif commun qui est d'organiser ce retrait ordonné à travers un accord, nous allons travailler aussi intensément que nécessaire dans les toutes prochaines semaines avant le prochain Conseil européen. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Michel. Last month, I welcomed Michel's recognition of the new dynamic in the talks created by the Prime Minister's Florence speech. That speech set out a clear and pragmatic approach to securing an agreement that works for both the United Kingdom and the European Union, one that heralds a new era of cooperation and partnership between us. During the October discussions, we isolated the key remaining issues on citizens' rights, Northern Ireland, and the financial settlement, as Michelle has just told you. So this week, our focus has been on finding solutions to those issues. It was, of course, uh, inevitable that our discussions would narrow to a few outstanding, uh, albeit important, issues. So we continue to work through these remaining issues, uh, consolidating the progress we've made since June, and exploring options for reaching agreement. And now is the time for both sides to move together to seek solutions. This is a serious business. So if we're to find a way forward, it will require flexibility and pragmatism from both sides, as I think Michel also stressed. We've been clear with the European Union we are willing to engage in discussions in a flexible and constructive way to reach the progress needed. So I'll now address each issue in turn. On Northern Ireland, we have continued to have good technical discussions. We have drafted joint principles on the continuation of the common travel area and associated rights. We have continued to explore how best we preserve North-South cooperation. And we are drafting joint principles and commitments which will guide the solutions drawn up in the second phase. We have also had frank discussions about some of the big challenges around the border. We remain firmly committed to avoiding any physical infrastructure and we've made that clear, we've been clear about that this week. These discussions, of course, will continue in the run-up to the December Council. But let's be under no illusion. We will only be able to conclude them finally in the context of a future relationship. We respect the European Union desire to protect the legal order of the single market and the customs union. But that cannot come at cost to the constitutional and economic integrity of the United Kingdom. As I said before, we recognize the need for specific solutions for the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland. But let me be clear, this cannot amount to creating a new border inside our United Kingdom. Now, in this process, we are resolutely committed to upholding the Belfast or Good Friday Agreement in all its parts. We need to approach the challenging issues that arise as part of this process in a spirit of pragmatism, 
creativity and with a high degree of political sensitivity. We owe that to the people of Northern Ireland uh, and of Ireland uh, to do so. We've continued to make progress on citizens' rights. We're now seeking political solutions to the last outstanding issues on both sides. Earlier this week, uh, as Michel said, we published a detailed note setting out our new administrative procedures for European Union citizens seeking settled status in the United Kingdom. This delivers on a commitment I made actually in the last round of negotiations uh, and uh, discussed in the um, press conference too. We listened carefully to the concerns about this process and we've responded. As our paper sets out, the new procedures will be as streamlined and straightforward as possible and will be based on a simple transparent criteria laid out in the withdrawal agreement. This week we've discussed options for resolving issues ranging from family re reunification to the export of benefits. For example, we've been clear that we're willing to consider what further reassurance we can give to existing families, even if they're not currently living together in the United Kingdom. There are few areas where our citizens need to see further progress and movement from the European Union on the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. Uh, the European Union's approach remains more narrow than we would like. We believe it's only right that people holding qualifications or in the process of acquiring them should be allowed to continue or begin their careers as they do now. We want to protect their livelihoods in line with our broader approach that people should be able to continue living their lives as they do now. On voting rights, we're disappointed the European Union has been unwilling so far to include this in the scope of the withdrawal agreement so as citizens may lose a right which they currently enjoy. However, if it does fall out of scope, we will discuss this issue bilaterally with member states. <laughs> Finally, this week we've sought to give further clarity on our commitment to incorporate the agreement on citizens' rights into UK law. This will ensure that European Union citizens in the United Kingdom can directly enforce their rights in UK courts, providing certainty and clarity in the long term. We make clear that over time our courts can take account of the rulings of the European Court of Justice in this area to help ensure consistent interpretation. But let me be clear, while we share the same aims, it remains a key priority for the United Kingdom uh, as we leave the, United, uh, the European Union to preserve the sovereignty of our courts. On the financial settlement, we've made substantial technical progress across all the issues uh, that uh, would need to be addressed. The Prime Minister was clear in her Florence speech, but let me reiterate once again. Our European partners will not, to ne will not need to pay more or receive less over the remainder of the current budget plan as a result of our decision to leave. The UK will honour the commitments we have made during the period of our membership. We are making clear progress in building a common technical understanding on every item here. So as I outlined, outlined at the start, this week has enabled us to consolidate the uh, progress of earlier negotiating rounds and to draw out those areas where further political and technical discussion is required. This is now about moving into the political discussions. That will enable both of us to move forward together. We must now look forward, uh, we must now look ahead to moving our discussions onto our future relationship. For this to happen, both party, parties need to build confidence in both the process and indeed in the shared outcome. And we remain ready and willing to engage as often and as quickly as needed to secure this outcome over the weeks remaining ahead of the December European Council. The United Kingdom will continue to engage and negotiate constructively, as we've done since the start. But we need to see flexibility, imagination and willingness to make progress on both sides if these negotiations are to succeed and we are able to re realize a new deep and special partnership. Thank you. Thank you both. I will start with the German uh, press agency, Verena, there on the left. I'm Verena with the German press agency. Uh, Mr. Banier, could you confirm for me that uh, you will need um, clarifications or concessions, whichever you prefer, uh, from the UK within two weeks in order to move on to the second phase in December. Thank you. Okay, let's move on the right. Yes, James. 
to the right, yeah. Mr. Davis, um, first of all, <laughs> what happened to accelerating these talks, as Mrs. May promised? This is, uh, it's been almost a month since you last met. These talks only lasted two days instead of the normal four. And do you understand business's concerns that time's passing and that this uncertainty is deeply damaging to them? And if I may, after watching recent events in London, how concerned are you now that before this process is over, you may be dealing with a different government in the UK? Shall I start? Uh, James, as I've just said, we, in, my, in what I said earlier, we remain ready and willing to engage as often and as quickly as is needed to ensure this outcome over the weeks remaining ahead of the December European Council. There's been a change in pace, I think, but ultimately this is about delivering results and that will depend on the content, not just the speed of the negotiation. I don't know really which is the easiest question between the two. Uh, non, je ne vais pas uh, évidemment faire de commentaires sur la situation uh, interne uh, politique au Royaume-Uni que nous suivons attentivement. Uh, évidemment, comme je suis attentivement le débat public au Royaume-Uni, et même uh, nous essayons uh, de donner uh, des clés, des informations, de répondre aux questions. J'ai été très frappé l'autre jour de, de l'émotion suscitée parmi un certain nombre de citoyens ou d'élus britanniques par le fait que je recevais Nick Clegg et, et deux élus euh, respectés de la Chambre des Lords et de la House of Commons. Et, mais c'est normal que ma porte soit ouverte, comme j'ai reçu avec beaucoup d'intérêt une délégation euh, de la Chambre des communes cette semaine. Euh, mais c'est tout le commentaire que je ferai. Nous négocions avec le gouvernement du Royaume-Uni. Celui qui est là et qui nous dit, euh, qui nous confirme qu'il sort de l'Union européenne, qu'il veut sortir du marché unique et qu'il veut sortir de l'Union douanière. Et voilà ce que je peux dire. And I saw Mark Peppercorn there, center left. Good afternoon. <coughs> Sorry, Mark Peppercorn, Netherlands. Mr. Barnier. Could you tell us also what you will do if you don't get the clarification you want within two weeks? And secondly, I mean, this is now the sixth round of negotiations. Well, maybe we should say five and a half because this week was not much. How confident are you that you will get clarification to continue to get a deal on sufficient progress in December if you look to what happened the last five and a half rounds? Thanks. Euh, euh, au niveau de nos équipes techniques, nous avons des échanges naturellement euh, entre les rounds pour euh, préparer les rounds, pour euh, euh, préciser un certain nombre de points. Donc euh, ces rounds sont, euh, vous, vous l'avez compris, euh, importants et notamment pour moi, de, de, de mon côté, puisque je travaille dans le cadre d'un mandat et sous le contrôle euh, du Conseil européen, du Conseil, euh, des États membres, euh, du Parlement européen, avec lesquels je dois, avant chaque round et après chaque round, avoir un, un dialogue approfondi. Voilà pourquoi il nous faut du temps. Et nous avons naturellement, entre les équipes très professionnelles euh, qu'anime euh, David Davis et Holly Robbins et euh, ma propre équipe, euh, nous avons des échanges et... et Des, des discussions pour euh, préparer euh, ces rounds. Euh, vous dites six rounds, oui, euh, mais, mais voyez bien la complexité de cette négociation, hein, dont tout le monde d'ailleurs n'a pas encore fait le tour. Je vous l'ai dit souvent ici, hein, sur le plan juridique, euh, euh, près d'un millier d'accords internationaux que le Royaume-Uni va d'une manière ou d'une autre euh, devoir quitter, euh, euh, des milliers de lois. Euh, conséquences humaines, sociales, qui sont prioritaires pour nous, euh, économiques, financières. Euh, ce n'est pas trop, c'est six rounds. Et comme le, le septième ne sera pas de trop. Maintenant, euh, il ne s'agit pas de tout régler dans le détail. Il s'agit euh, d'atteindre ce niveau de progrès suffisant. Et j'ai employé deux mots tout à l'heure. Des progrès euh, sincères et réels. 
de mon côté, je dois rendre des comptes justes à la fois aux citoyens sur leurs droits, euh, aux porteurs, euh, aux bénéficiaires euh, des politiques européennes, aussi bien au Royaume-Uni euh, que dans les 27 autres pays, et même, euh, permettez-moi de le rappeler, quand on parle du Fonds européen de développement, beaucoup d'acteurs ou de pays en dehors de l'Union, en Afrique notamment, euh, nous devons rendre des comptes justes. Et nous devons euh, prendre des, des décisions justes aussi pour préserver la stabilité et le dialogue en Irlande. Voilà. Euh, nous ne sommes pas encore à ce stade. Et euh, encore une fois, il ne s'agit pas de tout régler dans le détail. Nous aurons ensuite, si nous parvenons à un accord sur ces progrès suffisants, nous aurons plusieurs mois jusqu'au mois d'octobre 2018 pour finaliser la rédaction juridique, la finalisation de ce projet de traité. Mais euh, nous devons, sur le plan politique et sur le plan euh, technique et financier, avoir ce niveau de progrès suffisant sur les 300 sujets indissociables euh, des citoyens euh, de l'Irlande et euh, du règlement financier. Nous n'y sommes pas encore. Let's then go to the telegraph. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, Peter Foster with the uh, London Daily Telegraph. Uh, Mr. Davis, uh, you, you, said self, you yourself have said we need to move on to a political discussion about the money. This uh, week has been a stock-taking exercise, we are told. Can you tell us why you're going to be in any better place to make a deal in December than you were in October? And to Mr. Barnier, uh, These talks are, are deadlocked, Mr. Barnier, and you yourself had a very good suggestion about how to move them on, which was that you could talk transition with the British while thrashing out the details of the bill, but you were overruled by the member states. Do you feel you have the personal authority to conduct this negotiation, or put another way, who is running this negotiation? Is it you, or is it the French and the Germans? Can I start? Yes, um, well, the first thing I'd say is Uh, December depends on sufficient progress, and that's a commission construct, uh, and as Michel has just been explaining, what that looks like. But let's be clear. Uh, I've said on several occasions uh, in these press conferences, including today, there's no doubt that we have made and continue to make, including this round, significant progress across a whole range of issues. Across the board, we've made pro progress towards resolving some really difficult uh, questions. And that, that, of course, will continue at pace between now and December. And I hope it will lead to sufficient progress. Michel. Uh, merci, David. Je, je veux juste, uh, avant de répondre à votre question, uh, compléter ma réponse précédente. Uh, des progrès réels et sincères. Et c'est un état des lieux sincère et réel que je dois présenter sur ces trois grands sujets au Conseil européen et aussi au Parlement européen. Et si ce n'est pas le cas, nous continuerons et nous retarderons d'autant l'ouverture de la discussion sur le futur, dont fait partie, je réponds maintenant à votre question, dont fait partie et la période de transition qui concerne bien le futur puisqu'elle commencerait le 30 mars 2019, après la sortie effective de du Royaume-Uni des institutions européennes et, évidemment, le, la relation future euh, et le partenariat que nous souhaitons construire dans la durée avec euh, le Royaume-Uni. Euh, bien sûr, euh, l'Allemagne et la France ont un point de vue important euh, sur tous ces sujets. Mais moi, je fais attention à tous les points de vue de des 27 pays de l'Union européenne et du Parlement européen. Et je mesure tous les jours, euh, hier en Italie, où j'étais avec le Premier ministre, la semaine dernière en Slovaquie, euh, lundi prochain en Pologne, euh, comme dans les contacts que nous avons avec les autres pays et les autres gouvernements, je mesure à la fois tous les jours deux choses qui sont importantes pour moi, euh, et je ne le dirai pas si ce n'était pas le cas, l'unité des 27 et la confiance qu'ils font à leurs négociateurs. All our negotiators do not have unfortunately more time. Thank you all for your presence. See you.